You know, I hate to say it because, as I always do, I was cheering for them to win, but this was, in the end, really the perfect outcome for the Kraken. What's Kraken, everybody, and welcome back to Kraken r, r for the second to last time this season as the Seattle Kraken lose in regulation 4-3 to the Winnipeg Jets, which does help their case for getting the best possible draft spot that they can get. And honestly, they played a very good game, and it went down to the wire against one of the best teams in the NHL, and certainly as far as how they're playing right now, one of the few best teams going into the playoffs. Not to mention that they scored three goals again against the likely Vesna winner this season. So yeah, again, there really is a lot to like about how the Kraken played in this game against a good Jets team, even aside from the loss helping them in that draft spot situation, which we'll get to in a second, but they played a very solid game, still missing Vince Dunn, who didn't go on the road trip with the team, so his season is done, no pun intended, but even with a lineup that is not necessarily optimal against a good team and a goaltender who's hot, the Kraken put three on the board, which as it just so happens is not only more than they scored in each of their last three games, it's actually as much as they scored in those three games combined. So go figure that they score one goal against Dallas, which makes a little bit of sense. They're a pretty good team and good defensively. St. Louis, who's a little bit more middling, and the San Jose Sharks, who give up the most goals per game in the NHL. And then they come into Winnipeg and score three, triple the amount they scored against the Sharks, against the team that lets up the fewest goals per game in the NHL, only letting up 2.41 per game. So the Kraken bumped that number at least a little bit north. With all that said, though, we might as well get into the game and how that happened in the first place, how we got to that final score. As the Kraken send out basically the same lineup that they've sent out all road trips since the Coachella Valley guys went back to play with the Firebirds and get ready for that playoff run, with the difference being obviously Grubauer and Ned is there back to every other game, so this is likely Grubauer's last game of the season. He played fairly well. There's, eh, there's one that we'll get to, but it really wasn't his fault anyway. And then there's also the somewhat peculiar move of Tolvanen out for Tatar in, as Tatar, Yamamoto, and Belmar all end up playing in this game, and it could be that there's some minor bangs and bruises that are at the end of the season where it doesn't really matter. So it's not necessarily a comment on how tolvanen has been playing or anything like that. It could just be that he has some sort of underlying injury that wouldn't necessarily keep him out, but you might as well at this point. But anyways, puck drops and the game gets started. It's a pretty back and forth start, though really not that much to speak of as far as good offensive opportunities are concerned. Either way, this is kind of what you'd expect from the first and eighth best teams in the NHL when it comes to goals against per game. Like I said, the Jets giving up 2.41 goals per game and the Kraken eighth best in the NHL when it comes to preventing goals, only allowing 2.81 per game. So yeah, not a ton of offense either way. Eventually the Jets end up on a power play, which the Kraken do a pretty good job of killing off and it's a Jets power play that hasn't been great over the course of the season, but has been heating up here a little bit towards the end as they go into the postseason. So even though the Jets do get a couple of chances right as the power play is coming to an end, the Kraken are able to kill that off. Unfortunately, they have their first of two big defensive blunders over the course of this game, just a couple minutes after the power play is killed off. Well, I guess to be fair, it is a bit of a mixture of a defensive blunder from the Kraken and just a very nice play from Shifley in particular, but the Jets to get on the board first as Shifley behind the Kraken net is able with Schwartz all over him to get the puck off of the boards and then just flick it backhand across Grubauer's face from behind the net right out in front where a wide open Kyle Connor, and it does go through Larson's legs. So Larson is trying to cut off that passing lane. It just happens to get right through him. But Kyle Connor is wide open. So when the puck gets to him, he's able to just one time it right through Grubauer and into the net. Not much of anything Grubauer can do here other than hope it hits him, but it goes through his armpit into the net to give the Jets the one nothing lead as... Yeah, again, you just can't leave Kyle Connor that open, even if you do think you have the passing lane sealed off there with Larson between Shifley and Connor. At the very least, though, the Kraken don't allow the Jets to really build any momentum out of this ice-breaking goal, and over the next few minutes, we're back to, honestly, even less offensive hockey than we saw through the first few minutes of the period, and we get into the final couple minutes where we start to see a little bit more scoring fireworks, and it starts with the Kraken getting a few good chances as they finally get some consistent offensive pressure down at the Jets' end of the ice here in the final couple minutes of the period. But go figure that it's not actually that first real sustained offensive zone time that the Kraken have in the game here late in the first period that ends up getting the game tied for them. Nope, that ends up coming 
right after the Jets are finally able to get down to the Kraken end of the ice and then back down to the Kraken end of the ice. It's, of all people, Pierre Edward Belmar, who intercepts a pass, breaks that up, steals the puck, transitions it through the neutral zone, and then as he crosses into the offensive end, drops it for Tomas Tatar, who winds up and fires a shot through a screen that Belmar has set up as he crashes towards the net after dropping the puck for Tatar. And without any chance of seeing the puck coming towards him, it ends up past Hellebuck into the near side of the net to tie the game at one. So just as everyone expected, Tatar and Belmar are the two guys that get the Kraken on the board first, Tatar picking up his ninth goal of the season and Belmar just his third assist. And hey, now with just over a minute left in the first period and the Kraken having tied things up, this has been a pretty good first period for them. Not only are they going to go into the first intermission with the game tied, they've played a pretty even first period with the Jets and even overcame that one power play that they allowed the Jets to get. Well, that would all be true, except for the fact that we don't end up getting into the first intermission with the game tied, as once again, and we'd already seen this a couple of times in the same game on this road trip, the Kraken cannot escape the final few seconds of a period. As with about 15 seconds left in the period, the Jets have a face-off in the Kraken end of the ice, which they win, get the puck up to the blue line, eventually work it down the boards and then get it right across and down towards next to the net, where standing in the same spot that he got the first goal, Kyle Connor is completely left alone, wide open. He just handles the puck a few times, looking around, kind of confused at how he's that open, and then fires it past Grubauer into the net to give the Jets the 2-1 lead. And yeah, with this one, even aside from when it happens as the goal goes in with five seconds left in the period and the faceoff came with just 15 seconds left. So yeah, usually you like your odds of getting through those 15 seconds and into the intermission with the game tied. But even aside from when in the period the goal happens, well, maybe with the first Kyle Connor goal, you can maybe excuse how open he was because Larson was in that passing lane. And usually a defender like Larson, as good as he is, will be able to break up that pass. It still gets through him. The shot ends up on net. But this time... There's just really no excuse for how wide open the best offensive player on that team is. So then for the second time this road trip, just like with the game in Dallas, the Kraken have a hard fought, evenly played first period against a very good team in the Central Division that's destined for the playoffs. They're going to get into the first intermission with the game tied and then just, I don't know, I guess they... Forget that the final 10 seconds of the period count just as much as the other 19 minutes and 50 seconds do. But it is what it is. You just got to move on, use intermission to get over the frustration of allowing that goal in the last few seconds and get back to the way you were playing the game throughout the rest of the first period. And you have a chance to come back from this one goal deficit. But unfortunately, it does not stay a one goal game very long into the second period at all. As although the Kraken do get the first couple good chances of the second period in the first minute or so of it, the Jets end up getting a rush chance towards the Kraken end of the ice just past the two-minute mark, which is a bit of a haphazard rush. It's not like it's going to lead to a particularly dangerous opportunity for them, at least by the way they're entering the offensive end. Still, a shot gets off from well out along the boards by the top of the faceoff circle, where there's no screen on the way, so Grubauer is able to make the easy save seeing it coming all the way. It still bounces off of his pad, though, and rebounds off the chest of Schultz right in front of him. Schultz then desperately flails at the puck as it goes off of his chest over Grubauer and into the blue paint behind him, where Ehlers, who's fallen on his face, is laying right there, sees the puck and whacks it in with his stick to give the Jets the 3-1 lead. And I know I've said it a few times before. It's still very much true here and maybe more so than ever before this season, but I genuinely don't think that there's been a single play this season and correct me if I'm wrong, some of your memories are probably better than mine through 82 games or 81 I guess at this point. This one still to me seems like the best metaphor for the Kraken season as a whole when it comes to a single play, as on this play they do a lot of things well defensively to not allow a particularly dangerous scoring opportunity, a shot from well out, no screen, really not a ton of net front presence from the Jets, and actually including having net front presence from a defenseman on your team to clean up any rebounds. And in spite of all of that and a save from your goaltender, the puck still bounces off of him and rebounds into that defenseman and then goes over the goaltender somehow and just plops itself right in front of a Jets player who's on his chest but in the right spot at the right time to get the easy tap-in goal. So, so between all of that and Schwartz desperately flailing at the puck as it goes over Grubauer into the crease, that alone, I, uh, I just don't know if there's a, a better image or couple of seconds to depict the Kraken season, desperately flailing at it to try and prevent it from going into the net. 
but it still lands in front of an opposing player who taps it in. And of course, it certainly doesn't help that with this goal going in, we now find ourselves with an all too familiar score over these last few games of Kraken 1, opposing team 3. So you kind of like the chances of the Kraken to even things out the rest of the way, but just not be able to score, maybe put a couple off of posts, and maybe the Jets hit the empty net. It would also be somewhat fitting then if, say, Kyle Connor got the empty netter to finish off the hat trick. None of that ends up happening, though, and the Kraken, to their credit, do not allow the last few games and the fact that the score now looks similar or this unlucky bounce or even the goal in the last few seconds of the first period to affect them as they're able to press right back and wouldn't you know it, they're able to score a second goal in a single game. And just like with the Tars goal, it ends up being the ninth goal in the season for another Kraken player as the Kraken gets set up in the offensive end, but don't stay that way for very long as Riker Evans gets the puck and just walks it along the blue line before firing it on net where Yanni Gord has set up a screen and this puck is going pretty well wide of the net, at least by a couple feet, which honestly I think is an intentional shot here by Evans to put it wide of the net because he recognizes that the only person that has a chance to get a stick on this puck is Yanni Gord, and Gord is able to do just that with a beautiful hands-eye play, which is something that he practices, I'm sure all the time in practice, but also before every game, those tip-in opportunities net front sets up that screen, the perfect tip to redirect the puck from going a few feet wide of the net to going just a few inches inside the post, into the net, no chance for Hellebuck once again, who can't see the shot coming in the first place, much less being able to stop a redirected puck that good by Gord. So with Gord's ninth of the season, the eighth assist for Riker Evans and seventh assist secondary for Brandon Tanev, the Kraken pull back to within one and double the score that they've had in any one of their last three games. And actually following that goal, Gord would get another chance not too long after, that one doesn't go in, then the Jets push back and get a pretty good little few minutes of sustained momentum towards the Kraken end of the ice in the middle of the period. That all eventually evens out without any more scoring as we get into the later parts of the second period with the Kraken still down one. But the constant in the second period has been the great play of Yanni Gord and really that whole line, but Gord in particular. And wouldn't you know it, once again, just as was the case when the Kraken were down one in the final two minutes of the first period, Less than two minutes left here in the second, down one again. They're able to press here in the late stages of the period. It's the Gord line out there. Gord gets a couple of good chances on net. The Jets, though, look like they're going to be able to clean that all up with a couple good saves from Hellebuck and get it out the other way. But a mishandled puck on the way out before they can get it across the blue line leads to a steal from Gord and a two on O for he and Cartier as they go up net front. And so with all the time in the world on this two on O, Gord walks it up to one side of the net with Cartier on the other side. Eventually, as he gets close, faking a shot to get Hellebuck to commit to that side before passing it right across to Cartier, who roofs the shot into the back of the net to tie the game at three for Cartier, his 10th of the season as he was already sitting on nine goals. So that symmetry is... Uh, doesn't quite hold up with this goal, but it still ties the game for the Kraken. Gord, another fantastic play as he really, I mean, I shouldn't say one man brings the Kraken back into this game as he did have to redirect a good shot and awareness from Evans and then still had to rely on a good shot from Cartier. Even though Hellebuck was committed to one side, he still had the pad on the ice. So Cartier had to lift this one pretty well to get it into the net, which he's able to do. Still the Kraken late in the period tie things back up thanks to the heroics of Gord and company. And this time they're even able to keep that tied game into the intermission. And then honestly, the third period gets off to a pretty good start for the Kraken. Again, pretty back and forth, but the Kraken are getting the better chances and more numerous chances here early on. Eventually though, with the Kraken not scoring to take the lead, the Jets do even things out. And midway through the period, Jared McCann takes a pretty ill-advised hooking penalty. It's clearly a hook as Kyle Connor has the puck entering the Kraken end, but he's well defended. There's a couple Kraken players between he and the net, so it's not like he's on a partial breakaway or free break or even a one-on. -one. And with that being the case, when McCann hooks him, he's not even trying to split the two defensemen to get that rush chance. He instead is kind of just going right across the blue line and taking it over to the corner where he can maybe even dump it in. So there's really no reason for McCann to hook him here, but he does from behind, sending the Jets to the power play. And unfortunately, this time they do end up scoring on it. I suppose it does come in the final seconds of the power play, so the Kraken almost killed it off, but almost doesn't really count for anything. The Jets still do score in the final seconds as they're 
able to get set up in the offensive end, cycle the puck around the outside, eventually finding a passing lane into the middle where they have two players in the slot, one of which is able to screen off the Kraken defender while Tyler DeFoley with the puck makes a couple of moves and then fires the shot towards the far side of the net, where after faking Grubauer out to the forehand side, that backhand shot has a pretty open net to go into. It goes into it and gives the Jets the power play goal and the 4-3 to three lead. It also wouldn't help that the Kraken would send the Jets to a double minor not long after that, as Riker Evans is a little careless with his stick behind the Kraken net, so that leads to back-to-back -back power plays the Kraken have to kill off, which they do kill off, but the Jets just never really give the Kraken much to work with in the offensive end through the rest of this game. Eventually the Kraken go empty net, though that does take them quite a while to end up doing. The Jets never end up hitting it, but they do prevent the Kraken from scoring, so eventually the Kraken end up falling 4-3 to three to the Jets. So again, for the Kraken, this is a game that all in all is not one for them to hang their heads about. It is a well-fought game against a good team, and heck, even if they were still fighting for a playoff spot and this was more towards the middle of the season, this would be a game that I wouldn't be upset by them losing. They fought really well on the road against a good team after a tough couple of games on that back-to-back, -back, starting out the road trip in Dallas and St. Louis. So then to come in, missing one of your best players in Vince Dunn, also not an optimal lineup without Tolvanen in, they're able to go right toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Jets, score three goals on Hellebuck and that Jets defense, which is saying something. And ultimately, you could even point to the difference in this game being that horribly unfortunate bounce off of Grubauer and Schwartz that ends up going over Grubauer and into the net. Not Schwartz, Schultz, excuse me. And yes, of course, it does, like I mentioned in the open, also come with the silver lining of this being kind of the perfect outcome for the Kraken. They played well enough to be respectable, but also help their chances of having a better draft spot when it comes to the draft lottery or even just the first round of the draft, where they currently sit eighth in the draft order. And if they lose their last game, they're locked into that eighth spot. The only way they can really move at this point is they're not going to catch up to Ottawa, who did win their last game, but are still a point ahead of the Kraken or the soon to be Utah team, the Coyotes, who also didn't pick up any points, which real quick with that, if there are any Coyotes fans watching, I'm really sorry. Obviously, as Seattle fans, we know what it's like to lose a team. It, yeah, it sucks. So, uh, that, sorry about that. I don't really know what else to say about that. At least the good news is it sounds like the likelihood of the Coyotes or a team coming back to Arizona in the near future is pretty good. You won't have to wait almost two decades like Seattle's had to wait to get an NBA team back at the very least. But yeah, there's no way around the fact that that sucks. But anyway, as far as the draft order for the Kraken is concerned, they can't move up in the order from the eight spot with the Coyotes and Senators being above them, but they could still move down to the ninth spot if they were to pick up a point or win in Minnesota and the Flames were to lose to the Sharks in their final game of the season with the two teams currently tied in points, but the Flames have the tiebreaker on the Kraken in the standings with more regulation wins. So... As long as they stay tied or the Flames win and the Kraken lose, then the Kraken will lock in that 8th spot in the draft lottery and probably still be in the 8th spot when the draft rolls around, but you never know. Maybe they do win the lottery from the 8th spot. With that, though, let's get to the Kraken 3 stars for the second to last time this season. As always, brought to you by the patrons over on Patreon. If you want to help, I mean, one more game decide the stars, or if you, more importantly, want to help decide the Kraken awards at the end of the season, you can help support on Patreon and support the channel a little bit more than you already are. Also help decide things like which one-on-one videos I do over the summer and that kind of stuff. The link for that is down below. For the three stars in this game, the first one is obviously Yanni Gord, one of his best games of the season. Certainly that second period was just Yanni Gord show almost start to finish. Anytime he was on the ice, he was absolutely all over the place and threatening scoring for the Kraken and did it a couple of times once himself and the other time setting up Cartier for the goal. The second one for me, I am going to go with Ty Cartier. He also played very well on that line with Gord. A fantastic game and second period for him with that whole line playing well. And then the third star, I'm kind of between two guys. And either one of them, one of them won't be with the Kraken next season. Tatar, I'm not really sure. I could see it going either way. And I don't really want to just go with the three goal scorers. That seems a little bit too easy. So I am going to go off the board here and go with I mean, not totally off the board. He did get an assist, but I'm going to go with Pierre Edward Belmar. He had a fantastic game for the limited ice time that he had. 
it might be the last game he plays for the Kraken, depending on what lineup they decide to put out for the last game in Minnesota. But he did play very well, even aside from that whole play that he set up with the steal and the transition for Tatar's goal and then getting up to screen for Tatar to get that shot on goal and get it through in the first place. He also, before that, had a very good chance of his own that was set up by Tatar. So the two of them working very well together in this game. So yeah, I'll go with Belmar and then, yeah, honorable mention for Tatar. So the three stars in this second to last game of the season, we've got Gord 1, Cartier 2, and Pierre Edward Belmar 3. But as always, I'd love to know your thoughts down in the comment section below who your three stars would be and how we're feeling going into the last game of the season. At the very least, it seems like the Mariners are starting to turn things around a little bit. Boy, the pitching injuries sure are an issue there, but two wins in a row, so that's, that's nice. Until next time, though, the last game of the season. Stay safe out there, be good to each other, God bless, and go Kraken.